Zach, I'll pass it over to you and I think we can go ahead and get started. Okay. Um, thank you all. Uh, good morning, good afternoon to wherever uh, you are. Uh, so I think we'll start the today's session uh, at the NHRC. Uh, we have an exciting lineup of panelists as well as a great speaker for today. And the topic for today's uh, our discussion is preterm cardiomyopathy. So I'll start by introducing uh, myself first. I'm uh, Deepak Lewis. I'm one of the neonatologists as well as uh, ATN Echo trained uh, physician at um, uh, Winnipeg in Canada. And uh, we have three panelists joining today. Uh, first is Monica Sondi. She is a staff neonatologist at uh, Children's Hospital of Orange County. Uh, she is currently completing a one-year hemodynamic fellowship, and her interests are in the field of neonatal hemodynamics as well as uh, different physiologies of congenital hearts. Our second panelist is Nicholas Williams, uh, who comes to us from Australia. Uh, so he is um, uh, currently working at Surrey Memorial Hospital in British Columbia. Uh, previously, he has completed uh, a certificate in clinician performed um, ultrasound, as well as he was a lead uh, uh, TN Echo and focused uh, person at uh, Royal Prince Alfred Hospital in Sydney. Uh, and his interests are in the field of uh, using technology to enhance learning, as well as clinician performed ultrasound. And our last panelist is Angelica Vasquez. She is a neonatal cardiac uh, intensivist at uh, Columbia University Medical Center in US. Uh, she completed a neonatal hemodynamics fellowship at uh, University of Iowa, and uh, she's uh, main focus are, are in the uh, field of cardiac and cerebral hemodynamics, as well as the use of non-invasive clinical uh, monitoring tools in the uh, NICU. Uh, so thank you for all the panelists for joining uh, uh, us today. And uh, we look forward to an exciting discussion um, after the talk. Uh, now on to our speaker, uh, Abbas Hydri, who is a, a good friend of mine, is a neonatal intensivist for the Northern Alberta Neonatal Program and the education lead for the TN Echo and Hemodynamics Program uh, in the University of Alberta in Edmonton, Canada. Uh, he has uh, research training in advanced cardiac imaging and his academic interests include PDA, transitional physiology, and the use of multi-modal uh, monitoring in the ICU. Uh, so uh, thanks, Abbas. Welcome. And then we look forward to hearing your talk and the discussion after that. The floor is all yours. Oh, thank you, Deepak. Thanks for that kind introduction. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Um, the, thank you to the NHRC uh, for this kind invite to this August Forum of Neonatal Hemodynamic Experts. It's truly an honor. Today, we'll be tackling a controversial and a hot topic preterm cardiomyopathy. Well, I don't have any conflicts of interest, no endorsement of commercial products, but I would like to share some data that was done here, right here in Edmonton. And these are my team members and Professor Lisa Hornberger's Chief of Division of Cardiology is our principal investigator. In terms of full disclosure, I will have a couple of questions along the way and we'll discuss the answers at the very end. Well, let's start with the real life case. These are uh, real patients in our study. Names have been changed, Jack and John. You can stare at the uh, echo. What I will give you a clue is one echo is normal and one echo is abnormal. Now the task for you guys is to detect who is normal and who is abnormal. And we can talk about it in the discussion side of things. And you also may want to tell me why you think uh, either Jack or John was abnormal and what you can do about it. So we'll, in the meantime, while you're thinking, let's move on to the slides. So today's objectives are, we'll review the literature of this topic. We'll talk about some definitions, understanding the unique cardiomyopathy related to extreme preterm birth, identify the impacts short-term and long-term, try to explore some strategies. And I try to keep this talk a little bit broad for my junior trainees and early career uh, colleagues. Well, let's start all the way back from prematurity. WHO says that about 10% of the live births in the world are premature births, about 15 million annually. And this number, it keeps on increasing with premature uh, births and increasing complicated pregnancies with increasing advancements. This trend will only in increase 
and they have unique challenges at birth with sudden and sustained changes in loading conditions and added in ICU inserts, which I won't go into too much in detail. But what is interesting is they have unique outcomes. And let's talk about the outcomes related to mortality. This is an elegant work done in by Casey Crump. And the six million births have been analyzed by this data. If you see the x-axis here, age on the y-axis is adjusted hazard ratio for death. And yellow is term and red is extreme preterm. And it's quite self-explanatory to see that the younger you're born, the higher the risk of all-cause mortality. But as we all know, it's not only the mortality that's important, it's the outcomes. And we often talk about long-term neurodevelopmental outcomes, but we never talk about long-term cardiovascular outcomes. But this is data, again, coming from 2.6 million live births and some very cool uh, papers I have mentioned down there. The risk of cardiovascular-related mortality is nearly twice as much. The risk of cerebral vascular mortality is twice as much. These are European data. There are risk of long-term cardiovascular, metabolic diseases. That's why some of the experts nowadays, they are suggesting preterm birth itself should be classified as a chronic medical condition. Well, the most obvious chronic cardiovascular outcome is congestive heart failure. So this elegant graph shows that very clearly, if you look at this graph at the x-axis, is the incidence of heart failure, and the y-axis is the gestation age at birth. If one is a reference for a term, extreme preterm is 17, i.e. there's a 17 times higher risk of cardiac failure if you're born ELBW. And, if, and it is dose response. For late preterm is about one and a half times, for very preterm is about four times. So it's almost like a doubling and quadrupling effect you can see and it's anybody's guess what will be the risk if it is if there is another bar under 25 weeks. I would say it will be definitely higher. So in summary, we can say all preterms were not born equal. And the squaring effect is something we need to remember, at least in our ELBW counseling. I don't think it's now a standard practice to discuss this data in an ELBW counseling. But one may ask, why this effect? Why are these preterm births getting cardiac failure? Thanks to Adam Lewandowski and his Oxford team who taught us what, what happens to that heart of the preterm young adult. This is a landmark paper published in circulation that helped us open this Pandora's box. Look at this, about 100 um, patients, preterm born young adults at about 20 to 30 years of age. They are assessed by cardiac MRI and young adults as well. If you look at the top panel, the blue box, the preterm born young adults, the LV mass was higher than the ones who were born at term, the green box. And the ones who were born at term, when you compare them to the older terms, they were the same. So in summary, what did Adam tell us that the hearts of the preterm born young adults are thicker and this picture shows it very well. It's thicker, there's reduced end diastolic volume, there's reduced stroke volume, there is myocardial fibrosis, there is diastolic dysfunction. But what's also very important and often under-recognized is because the increase is about 19 grams on average, if you do the math according to the Framingham Heart Study, there's a 50% increased risk of cardiovascular event just because the left ventricle was thicker. Now, knowing the heart anatomy is not enough. We also need to know what is the physiology. What happens if these hearts are pushed to the limits of physiology? Well, Odero Hackstep helped us understand this in one picture. If you look at this, the x-axis is the peak exercise intensity and the y-axis is ejection fraction and the red are the preterms. So the more the exercise intensity, the lesser the preterm will manage, i.e. the ejection fraction will go down in preterm 
but it, somehow the terms, they would remain the same. In other words, there is a physiological stress when preterm born young adults are put through moderate to severe exercise intensity. Well, with so many studies coming out and all this data coming out for long-term cardiovascular outcomes, we need one study that can put all this together. So this meta-analysis helped us put all that together. It's a meta-analysis of 38 studies, about 3,000 live births. And if you can see, from neonates to infants to children have been arranged. And they actually um, measured the left ventricular E prime, which is a diastolic dysfunction metric. And in every age group, the E prime was lesser than their term counterparts, suggesting there is diastolic dysfunction starting from neonates all the way till adult if you are born extreme preterm. I won't go into this slide, but this is a beautiful picture showing all the things that we talked thus far in one slide. Uh, if anybody is interested, it's a nice um, article to read. But a couple salient points. In infancy, we talked about the heart rate, the heart size smaller, their higher risk of pulmonary hypertension, hypotension in childhood, their decreased exercise capacity, vasculopathy, aortic stiffness, in adulthood, more hypertension, metabolic disease. And once a pregnant woman who was born preterm uh, gives birth to another child, there's a 50% increased risk of vascular etiology. So what is known as the spillover effect to the next generation. And this is carrying on. So I think by now, I hope I have convinced my audience that this is a unique cardiovascular pathophysiology and it's related to extreme preterm birth. All we have to do is just find a name. Well, this article suggested one. So let's go over to uh, the definition of cardiomyopathy. The American Heart defined cardiomyopathy very simplistically that it's a disease of the myocardium where there is a dysfunction. Then there's many types of classifications, there's a primary, there's a secondary, but we won't go into that for today. All we want to talk about is if the cardiomyopathy, which is related to extreme preterm, is when there is a structurally normal heart, meaning in a structurally normal heart, if there was no other cause except preterm birth, that would be increasingly now called preterm cardiomyopathy. Now, there are some talking points that we can talk about, uh, the animal data, human data, in NICU, out of NICU. We'll also talk a little bit about our own data. We'll talk about some diagnostic tools, basic science, clinical applications, potential approaches, and some directions. So uh, very briefly, we'll touch on these points. Let's start all the way back from animal studies. This is an elegant work done by Jonathan Bensley in the UK uh, about a decade ago, what preterm lambs who were about 34 weeks human equivalent, they were euthanized at about nine weeks post preterm birth. And on the left lower panel, you see the myocardium. It's more uh, whitish, there's less pinkness to it. And the preterm uh, myocardium has more pink. And that is the pink is actually the interstitial fibrosis due to collagen and collagen takes up the hemotoxin and eosin stain. So they actually quantified that the preterm lamb had seven times higher collagen. And not only that, the cells were thicker and there was cardiomyocyte hypertrophy. In other words, potentially there was less cardiac endowment and there was a cardiac hypertrophy as a secondary compensation. But then what about humans? Again, thanks to Adam and his team, he helped us look at the human myocardial fibrosis while we are still alive. He used a very unique technique that has been used in adult cardiac amyloidosis, where they use a cardiac MRI and gadolinium enhanced uh, technique. So on the left lower panel, you see the blue dots are the preterm born adults and the red dots are the term born adults. You see the cells are larger and they are hypertrophied when you are born preterm. If you look at the top graph, 
you see there's myocardial fibrosis identified by this cardiac MRI in the preterm born adults. He also noted that there were diastolic dysfunction in the preterm, the blue graph versus the red identified by echo and strain. So in summary, in this study, very elegantly, we saw for the first time a human heart, live human heart, having myocardial fibrosis and diastolic dysfunction and increased cardiac myocyte cell volume. Putting all this together, it raises a very big question. What about diastolic dysfunction? What is happening here? How can we deal with this? To understand diastolic dysfunction, we need to do a little bit of diastology review. I hope it's okay. I know there are a lot of expert hemodynamics uh, on the call, but there may be a few trainees as well. So for the sake of everybody, I would like to do a couple of refresher slides on diastology. So four big principles of diastology in extreme preterm, the extreme immaturity of the myocardium itself, there's less cardiac endowment, there's a faster heart rate, less filling, poor calcium handling, sudden change in loading conditions after birth, high afterload, shunts, preloads, and also very importantly, the LV is stiffer in the extreme preterm. They have the type of collagen is type one, which is a very rigid one. And with time, it changes to a type three. And there's also poor springs, poor restoring forces. Now, we have seen this a million times from first year med school, but just we can stare at it for a couple of seconds. I won't go into this. This is diastole and this is systole, E and A and IVRT. And this is your regards diagram and your pressure volume loops. As they say, there's an elephant in this room, or rather a Titanic. But jokes apart, what is this? So this paper, Johannes Janssen actually said, Titan plays a titanic role in diastolic dysfunction. So literally, it's a largest protein in the human body, and it also plays a very large role in the diastolic function of the human uh, myocardium. And I'll go over a little bit about the titan. So it's basically a spring at the corner of the contractile unit, literally a spring, and there are two types of spring, a soft version and a stiff version. For example, if you have diastolic dysfunction, then you have the stiffer version, so it doesn't relax as well. And if you have systolic dysfunction, then you have the softer version. And the beauty of this spring is they can adapt based on the changing loading conditions from softer to stiffer based on the needs of the human at the time. And also it adapts over age. And you can see this from fetus to adult, it changes its morphology from a soft to stiff. But if anybody wants to know anything about diastolic dysfunction, I think a good starting point is this ASC guidelines from Sharif. And I won't go too much into details, but just big principles here. So there are three big principles in diastology. One is the active relaxation based on the actin, myosin, troponin, tropomyosin here. The restoring forces of the springs. Uh, this is a spring at its resting length. When you compress it, uh, this is the L minimum. And then when you release it, it comes back to its resting length. So that is your restoring forces. And this is the lengthening load. So this gentleman is pushing the pressure in the left atrium, trying to forcefully open the mitral valve into a left ventricle that is very stiff. So that is the LA pressure. So in general, these are the three principles of diastology measured by these five pressure. And we usually use either an invasive or a non-invasive method to identify. Obviously, we're going to talk about non-invasive today. And in adults have it easy. They have only four parameters that they use to diagnose diastolic dysfunction. Left atrial volume index, tricuspid regurgitation, left ventricle E prime, E by E prime. And they say that if you have more than two out of four positive, you have DD, simple. Whereas in preterms or infants or in pediatrics, we don't have our own guidelines. So we just fall back to the AAC adult guidelines. And then you can also differentiate whether the diastolic dysfunction was the early part of the diastole or the late part. 
And the common marker of early diastole is the E by E prime, and the common marker of the late diastole is the E by propagation velocity, E by VP. Now we took this diastolic dysfunction and our own program, we tried to study this in the preterm population at the Royal Alexander Hospital in Edmonton. Lisa Hornberger was our principal in, uh, investigator and preterm babies were born about 27 weeks at about one month of age. We looked at their echo data. We found that they were all having normal systolic function, but they had reduced diastolic function, the E prime was reduced, the A prime was increased, the E by A was abnormal. So you see the preterm infants had diastolic dysfunction in spite of having normal systolic function. And what's also interesting is the atrial function was abnormal. They were, the atrium was working harder to push blood through the mitral valve compared to the controls. There was increased filling pressure, but the E by E prime was increased in the preterm compared to controls. This was very interesting data, and it suggested that the preterms, they had altered diastolic dysfunction, but what's more interesting is it persisted even when they reached term, and it never became equal to their counterparts at term. And proving that there is something about prematurity that makes their heart stiffer and diastolic dysfunction. Now let's look at what other groups have done. This is an elegant work done by Nilkant uh, in Australia. So ELBW infants at about uh, 36 weeks of age, he not only showed us that these babies had diastolic dysfunction, but they also had abnormal shape. So the E by E prime was definitely abnormal when you compare it from preterm and term but he also showed that the shape was thicker, they were more dilated, they were more spherical hearts basically in the face of a normal systolic function. Well, David Cox took it to the next step. He just showed the same thing in pictures. He used a cardiac MRI and he atlassed the cardiac um, uh, my, myocardial um, walls. And it's very self-explanatory if you look at this, the less than 26 weeks, they are more globular, more thicker compared to their term controls, more thinner, more conal. In, and if you look at this graph, it explains it in numbers. If term is one, extreme preterm is 1.6, the LV mass index, i.e. The, the left ventricular mass is 64% higher than its term counterparts. And then what did Nadine in Afif very intelligently took 200 babies and they went and checked them out at about 12 hours of age. And they said, okay, we have a, one group who are on CPAP, one group on invasive ventilation, and let's look at their diastolic function. And they found that babies who were invasively ventilated had poor diastolic function. They had E prime was abnormal, E by e, A prime was abnormal and was statistically significant. What is more interesting is they found that the babies who were having diastolic dysfunction and invasively ventilated, they had 10 times higher risk of pulmonary hemorrhage and also higher risk of IVH. Then it begs the question, was there something related between diastolic dysfunction, higher risk of invasive ventilation, higher risk of pulmonary hemorrhage and IVH? Then this, is there a critical subpopulation who does this and is there a critical window that we can target? So that's the question. Curti Wall in Australia, he took the modified ACE criteria and he looked at the babies who had PDA. I won't go into this criteria. I showed you the ASE guidelines, uh, but he took this criteria and he applied to babies who had PDA. And he found that at about one month of age, if you're an ELBW, you have about 25% chance of meeting the LVDD criteria. And not only that, he showed that the prolonged exposure to PDA was associated with diastolic dysfunction. And this very nicely showed in this graph, the longer you are exposed to the PDA, the higher risk of diastolic dysfunction as per the modified AAC criteria. So that begs another question, is there something about diastolic dysfunction 
that is contributed by prolonged PDA exposure. Maybe there is increase of left atrial pressure. There's a backup into the pulmonary capillary vet pressure, increasing respiratory distress and worsening respiratory outcomes. Well, the question then became, could we not combine PDA and diastolic dysfunction to better predict respiratory outcomes? Well, Afif and group just did that. They actually combined diastolic dysfunction and the PDA into one metric, and they called it the score, the Alkafash score. So what is interesting is in this five uh, variables, one is a diastolic dysfunction variable, which is the A prime, one is the prematurity, and the other three are hemodynamic significant PDAs. Not only the size, we know PDA size doesn't matter, is the size with the high volume with the pulsatility. So the combination of hemodynamic significant PDA, prematurity, and the diastolic dysfunction, he was able to plot it on the x-axis, the score, and the y-axis, the predictability of poor respiratory outcomes or death, BPD. And I think the cutoff was about five or six when it starts showing high sensitivity and specificity. So this is again going on to show, tell us that the babies who are born with a PDA, uh, who are born early, who had diastolic dysfunction, did poorly in terms of respiratory outcomes. But we knew that from our, from our follow-up clinics and so on, that they did poorly from a respiratory outcomes. What we didn't know is what happens to the preemies later on, like, like let's say 10 years of age or 10 to 12 years of age. So our group, try to look at this. So again, uh, in Edmonton, in Royal Alexandra Hospital, we had extreme preterm babies who were born. We brought them back at about 12 years of age uh, under the new breath study, which was published by Joanna McLean in Thorax. And about 100 uh, kids came back to us and we divided them into three groups, micro prems, less than 25, very prems, 26 to uh, 28, and term controls, and then we try to interrogate and see their echo data, their cardiopulmonary exercise data, and try to see if there was any difference. It was disheartening. There was no difference. Each, each child had about 200 echo variables, and it was um, really painful to do that many echo variables to see there was no difference. And this is the data. Uh, this is still in publication. Uh, I mean, in preparation for publication, we're just doing up the manuscript. The, the systolic um, and the in the systolic and the diastolic function of the conventional echo, there was no difference, except if you see there's a small signal here, SD ratio was different between the term and the micro prem. Although it could be something that is uh, just a chance, so we didn't pay too much attention to that. And then we looked at the strain, there was no big difference, didn't, no meaningful data there. So we started to think maybe we should increase our sensitivity of our tools. So we went to a twist. So we use twist mechanics to identify the groups. Again, for the purpose of the broader audience, I'd like to one or two slides on a twist. So twist, as the name suggests, is just a twisting of the heart, just an overview of cardiac twisting. This is a video which shows uh, the twisting. As we all know, the heart has helical fibers arranged uh, in the left hand and right hand uh, axis. And when they twist at the apex and at the base, the net force is this yellow line. And we can calculate the twist, its speed, its uh, peak, and many variations of how the heart is twisting and untwisting. So twisting relates to uh, the systole and the untwisting relates to diastole. One of the problems of this technology is there is no common yardstick. There are many softwares. Each software has a different way of doing it. Each software has a own normative data. So we chose to use our own methodology, we actually published, our group published uh, in this. And so this is from the same paper and this is from our own patient data. So it's exactly the same. We could match what was the publication, the methodology part of it. 
using this methodology, we applied to our patients. And now you can see every parameter was abnormal when you compared the microprem with the term. For example, the microprem was twisting eight degrees. And sorry, my apologies. The term was twisting eight degrees. The microprem was twisting 12 degrees. So they were twisting 50% more. And they're twisting at, let's say, 85 degrees per second whereas the micro prime was 107 degrees per second. Again, they're twisting not only higher, but they're twisting faster. So they're kind of basically working harder to maintain the cardiac output and showing us a normal conventional echo. What about the diastole? Exactly the same. They were untwisting faster, untwisting higher. And not only that, the most important thing is the relaxation was poorer. See, the percentage of untwist at the mitral valve opening, it's simply a way of telling the relaxation, how much of a relaxation is occurred when the mitral valve is open. And if you see, the term controls had relaxed about 40% of its diastole, whereas the microprams could relax only about 20%, i.e. they are only one-fifth relaxed, whereas their terms were already two-fifth relaxed at the mitral valve opening. So kind of they are slow in relaxation. There's an impaired relaxation. And again, we show that in graphs here. So terms versus preterm, the SD ratio was different as we showed earlier. This is uh, commonly seen in elderly hearts, commonly seen in mild left ventricular diastolic dysfunction. Then we also show that it is dose response with your increase, uh, with your gestation going smaller or lesser and lesser, your torsion and untwist becomes worse and worse. So there's a dose response. We showed that both in the twist and the untwist. Excuse me. So again, the as I explained, the percentage of untwist, 40% and 20%. Our study could be summarized in two slides. On the left-hand side, if you see, the red graph is the microprems. They twisted higher and the untwisted slower. You see the twist is only 19% before the mitral valve open. So there's this isovolumic pressure decline or what is called the DP by DT is abnormal. When you compare it to the terms, they twisted lesser and they relaxed better. So basically the preterm, the microprams were much different than the terms, both in systole and diastole. And this is very interesting how that they relax, their poor relaxation. And this is the data from the micro, myocardial fibrosis paper that I showed you from Adam Lewandowski. So our graphs match their diastolic dysfunction uh, graphs. On the right-hand side, this is a graph that shows the exercise uh, capacity and is inversely uh, related. The preterms are the red and the terms are the black. So they're poor exercise capacity. Now, this is a busy slide. I won't go into the details of it, but there are two big concepts. When we compared our study for the rest of the world, we want to mention two things. When you're reading this data, you have to pay attention for two things. One is the gestation at birth of those patients is a 32-weeker is very different from a 26-weeker. Remember the squaring effect, the doubling and quadrupling effect? Those two hearts are not the same. Number two, the birth eras, if you're born in the 70s and 80s, is not the same as you're born in the 2000s because we all know the surfactant and the nitrate and the uh, high frequency, all of that changed in the last 30 years. So they're two different populations. Anyways, finally, we'd like to uh, summarize our study that teenagers born uh, extreme low birth had normal systolic function the diastolic dysfunction became manifest using twist mechanics and the diastolic dysfunction exaggerated with greater prematurity in exercise. We like to think it's just like a duck. We are calm on the outside, but underneath we are paddling furiously to stay afloat. And we speculate, is this a compensatory mechanism? But what's more important is if you join the dots, this becomes really interesting as to why this preterm born adolescent is similar to an elderly uh, heart. If anybody can recognize this elderly gentleman, 
I will talk about it in the in the discussion. He has contributed uh, to something in cardi pediatric cardiology, but was not recognized for 30, 35 years. We'll talk about it. It's very relevant to today's talk. Anyways, so the ELBW hearts are very similar to an elderly heart because this is a natural progression of the untwist. With age, your heart becomes stiffer and your untwist becomes higher. So somehow the ELBW's heart is like an old man's heart. In other words, there is a bold statement we can make here that when you're born ELBW, you have a correction factor. For example, if you're born, let's say 25 weeks, when you are 40 years age, you're probably, your heart is about 65. You have to, there is a correction factor that has to be incorporated. Currently in the medical literature, that is not there. This is the Framingham risk calculation for 10 year cardiovascular mortality. You can see clearly prematurity is not mentioned as a risk factor. Although we have data from more than 6 million live births that it is a risk factor, but it has still not gone into mainstream um, calculations. But all this is fine, but can we use this in the NICU? These advanced tools can be used. It's very limited data in very early days. Ashling and Afif did some work uh, on torsion in the neonatal period. They took a 50 babies, ELBWs, in the first week of life, they did torsion and twist. And the red is the preterm and the blue is the term. They found that with increasing days of age, the diastolic dysfunction got worse and they speculated it was because of the sudden increase in postnatal loading conditions and it got worse. Adam James, he did the same thing uh, in the 26 week stable infants about a one kilo of age. And one of the things that he was uh, mentioning was that the frame rate to heart rate ratio was about 80%. If you maintain that ratio, it becomes feasible to do a torsion mechanics in the preterm population in the first week of life. So this is your strain, your basal and apical strain from Adam's paper. And this is the diastolic twist and untwist, both of the apical and the basal region. And his data is shown here. But what's also important is, it's not only that his data is here, when you compare his data with others and our papers are here, it is different. And this begs the bigger question is, can we compare apples to apples? And that has, as I mentioned earlier, that has been an issue with the twist mechanics. That's why the group in Norway came up with this technique where they said, instead of going into the twist, let's go into the myocardial work itself. Let's find out how did the myocardium work like we would do in the invasive cath lab but they did it non-invasively, which is very interesting. So uh, they about 100, 120 uh, infants were born at 27 weeks. They came back at 27 years of age and they looked at their hearts non-invasively with an echo and they could draw out their pressure volume loop as if it was a cat lab. And they could identify the myocardial work and they actually showed us data that the preterm born young adults had abnormal strain compared to the term and the myocardial work was abnormal compared to the controls. Although they, they suggested that the, the trend was there, but it didn't meet statistical significance. It was 0.08 p-value. Nevertheless, this is early days for this uh, technology. I think we are in the era of non-invasive precision medicine, and I don't think we can get any more precise than myocardial work without putting a catheter in the heart. Now, all this is fine, but the question is, what can we do about it? So I'll take you through a couple um, studies where they've done some treatments. So this is a very uh, elegant work done from McGill, Marianne Bertagnoli. She took uh, two sets of rats and both of them are induced by oxygen-induced uh, cardiomyopathy and one was treated with water and one was treated with uh, angiotensin receptor blockers, losartan. And they were euthanized and they saw the babies or the rat babies, so to say, who received angiotensin receptors blockers had a thinner left ventricular poster wall and lesser LV mass index compared to ones who got water. So the water rats 
were thicker. You can see there's lots of fibrosis, but the ARBs was lesser. In other words, by using ARBs, you could actually remodel and reduce the preterm cardiomyopathy in the rat model. Another fascinating work, again, by uh, Marianne from McGill. Proof of concept here. I won't take you through this entire uh, biochemical pathway, but it's interesting to see the renin-angiotensin system. As we can recall, there are two arms to this uh, renin-angiotensin. One is the pro-fibrotic, and one is the anti-fibrotic arm. What she said is, when you block the pro-fibrotic pathway and let the metabolites drain into the anti-fibrotic pathway, and she gave those rats alamandine, oral alamandine, she could replicate the same findings what she saw on an ARB. In other words, it's a proof of concept that by modulating the renin angiotensin axis, you can reduce the preterm cardiomyopathy. And this is without alamandine, lots of fibrosis, and with alamandine, minimal fibrosis. Now, this has been shown in animal models where you modulate the renin angiotensin, you can prevent preterm cardiomyopathy. What about humans? Steve Abman and Peter Morani from Colorado used ACE inhibitors in later infants. For example, these are some case reports. A 28 weeker who was a chronic lung went home, came back on oxygen, was diagnosed to have pulmonary hypertension. They were started on nitric and the baby worsened. And it was full of fluid. In fact, when they took the child to the cat lab, they found it was the problem was the opposite. It was a diastolic dysfunction problem and the LA was dilated and there was water or there was pulmonary edema in the capillary, uh, pulmonary capillaries leading to worsening. So uh, the baby was now uh, put on ACE inhibitors to relax the LV diastole and went home um, recovered. So uh, Steve Appman has shown that this is a common recurrence, about 8 out of 33 in his cat lab, we see this phenomenon. What about uh, this um, index? Arvind Segal from Australia showed this very elegantly uh, in this graph. It, the x-axis is the mean velocity, which is a contractility index, and the y-axis is the afterload index, the ends the end systolic wall stress. So this relation. So what he told us that if you had a higher afterload, then you have a lower contractility, i.e. when the heart is pumping against the wall of bricks, it's not contracting well enough. And the reverse is true. And he showed us in numbers. So basically, this stress velocity index was shown. But then if you go and find out where in the world people are doing stress velocity index, the Japanese have been doing this for the last 15 years. And this is the outcome data from Japanese uh, networks. The red is the Japanese, and this is the rest of the world. They definitely outcomes are better uh, than the rest of the networks. But if you go and analyze their TNE protocol and you look closely, ELBW infants get uh, echo, and if they have poor contraction, uh, as measured by the velocity index, MCVFC, and if they have an excessive afterload, then those infants are now treated with a dilator or the classical LMNOP of our med school where we treat adult uh, heart failures with Lasix, morphine, oxygen, nitrate, positive pressure, and propped up position. So literally they use the LMNOP if you met this criteria um, of stress velocity index or what they called as afterload mismatch. Then again, they replicated the study. Very similar. I won't go into the study. Again, the same thing. If you had high afterload, if you fall in the A zone, you got nitrates. If you fall in the I zone, you got dobutamine because you want to support the pump rather than the afterload. Now, Toyoshima from Tokyo, Katsuaki Toyoshima, he did this very elegant study in which he took ELBWs and he did serial echoes to eight to 12 hours, I think, for five days. And he divided into two groups, the infants. The group with the triangle are the ones who had grade three, grade four IVH, who had pulmonary hemorrhage, who had PVL bad outcomes. And the, the ones with the round were the ones who had good outcomes. What he found was 
at about somewhere on 24 or 30 hours to 60 hours, the afterload suddenly increased in the groups who had bad outcome and their contractility decreased at the same time. It begs the question, there's something about that window. If you remember Cote de Wall at about 12, um, uh, Cote de Wall as well as Ashling and Afif at about 12 hours of age, they told us there was left ventricular diastolic dysfunction. There's, there's something between 12 and 24 hours where potentially there's a window of a target where we can get in and try to modulate this. And uh, that is the concept that is emerging. Is there a target window? And then now, what did what did they do? So before 2000, they were using the standard of care, but then after 2000, they changed to the stress velocity approach. And what did they find? They found the IVH dropped from 22% to 4%. Pulmonary hemorrhage dropped from 20% to 7%. And not only the short-term outcomes, the long-term outcomes also changed. So this is a paper, about 8,000 microprems, 22 weeks, 23 weeks, and 24 weeks. And the survival was about 75% in this subpopulation. And the survival free of neurodermal outcome was about 78%. The outcomes are not bad at all, but I know um, in Iowa from Patrick's group, their outcomes are even better uh, and I'm not telling that it's because of the stress velocity they're getting these outcomes. It's a bundle effect for sure, but it's something to look into. Putting all this together, so far we have not found a solid evidence what is uh, the treatment for preterm cardiomyopathy, except this randomized controlled trial, which was done by Alan Lucas in the 80s. Alan took uh, two groups, one is uh, preterm infants who were formula fed and human fed, uh, human milk fed, apologies. And this RCT was done 25 years ago in Cambridge. But Adam Lewandowski brought them back at 25 years of age and used cardiac MRI to now assess the LV diastolic volume index. And you can see the blue box are the, are the um, patients who had received formula versus the orange are the ones who received uh, human milk. So their heart has improved the fact that they had got human milk, but they didn't improve as much as, as if, if you were born at term. In other words, the preterm cardiomyopathy can be improved if they were given human milk at birth, but they still will have preterm cardiomyopathy compared to their term colleagues. And this is a concept that started us to think is there something in the breast milk that is protective? Afif and group and Phil Levy and Amish, Adam, all of them came together on in this study with a, about 100 ELBW uh, infants. They compared uh, with the term controls and they said, if you got four weeks of human milk, we'll take you in the study and we'll check your echo at one year of age. And they found there was a linear correlation is the more milk you got, the better the cardiac function measured by strain. But what's also important, they found that it is the receiver operating curve was 87%, which is very correlative. So in other words, the bottom line is there was something in the breast milk that was cardioprotective and improved their cardiac function. So the old saying that the breast milk is the liquid gold is probably still true. Now the question is, where do we find gold? If you go into the breast milk literature itself, there's this new emerging literature in the last one to two years where it says the human breast milk has a cardiac remodeling effect. There are a couple metabolites or starches, I should say, human milk oligosaccharides that blocks the angiotensin II receptors. They are known as 6-silo-lactose and 3-silo-lactose. And Interestingly, these are now FDA-approved lacto-engineered milks that are uh, commercially available, and these are known to block angiotensin receptors. And it's anybody's speculation, it's probably these um, oligosaccharides that cardio-model and change the preterm cardiomyopathy, both in the rat model showed by Marianne Bertagnoli and the Alan Lucas RCT shown by Adam Lewandowski.
And I think for now, as we dig deeper, we don't have an answer, but one thing is for sure, the search continues. We should find an answer to this phenomena. And in summary, what I can say is one sentence the one sentence summary is the adult born preterm have increased mortality and morbidity, but we don't have a proven therapy except breast milk. And there are some emerging signals of hope. Thank you again for your time. It was a pleasure. Happy to take questions. Thank you, Abbas, for that uh, fascinating talk. Um, I would request uh, the panelists uh, to join as well. And I think we'll uh, we'll take any questions from audience uh, to have a discussion. So uh, just to get the uh, our discussion going, Abbas, I had a few questions when I kind of read about this topic. So um, from some of the studies, it appears like uh, the preterm heart, as as they get into adulthood, it's more dilated. Uh, whereas in uh, similar studies, they also find that. Uh, uh, there is an increase in the wall thickness and it's more hypertrophied. So is it possible for us to classify this like cardiomyopathy as, is it kind of a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or is it dilated or is it kind of a mix of both? That's an excellent question, Deepak. Thank you. So, and this is probably uh, what I was trying to allude when I was um, talking about um, the differences in the literature. And I'll go back to that slide debug, if you don't mind. Sure. Yeah. So this slide kind of answers your question a bit. So if you look at this uh, gray um, boxes, they have increased left ventricular mass index. The Adam Lewandowski study, 66 versus 55. So the that group had thicker LV mass or LVH. Now, if you flip into the modern era, the blue blue table, you see they're actually the opposite. You see, there is, uh, let's say 39 versus 44, meaning two eras are showing us two different uh, results in the two different directions. So there's a lot of uh, back and forth in the discussions of all these papers as to why this phenomenon is happening. Either really is it left ventricular hypertrophy or is it the left ventricle is lesser? So the most relevant explanation is that it was likely the change in the practice and the gestation. As I mentioned, this is 32 weekers and this is 26, 28 weekers. Maybe at that time, it was a different NICU practice. And at that time, uh, the also the babies were bigger. There were 32 weekers. Whereas if you're born at 26 weeks, what happens is you have less amount of time in utero, what is classically now called as the less cardiac endowment. That means you don't have enough time for your cardiac muscles to be uh, to be developing in utero because ex utero, you don't have cardiac myotrophy, uh, myocardial development. You only have myocardial hypertrophy. There is no increase in number. So the babies who are born very preterm, 26 weeks and all of these, they have less time in utero, so they have less cardiac endowment. So this endowment is the answer to this question in the literature, why there is a difference between the left ventricle hypertrophy and the dilated uh, smaller babies. And this is an ongoing discussion. I don't think we have an answer for now. Only with more and more literatures in the new era, this will become more clear. I hope I answered your question, uh, Deepak. Thank you. Yeah, Deepak, so it's, it's, it's Nick here. If I can jump in and Adam in his uh, editorial following the Cox um, uh, results showing the using the MRI uh, to show the, the thicker walled left ventricles, he does point out that, you know, this is going to be influenced by postnatal steroid use uh, as well as invasive uh, um, time on invasive me mechanical ventilation, which again, as Avis has said, is clearly changed in those cohorts from the 80s to you know more recent times so there's definitely a difference in those uh, practices that are occurring that are going to impact on the, the degree of you know uh, left ventricular wall mass and thickening thanks nick that was makes sense 
just looking at the q and i don't think we have any questions so far oh Bye -bye. There's, there's a couple oh. there's um oh, sorry that's okay um so one question was could you tell us a little bit more about the different reasons that babies are born preterm and which ones are more likely um is it known which ones are more likely to develop um diastolic dysfunction in these ways thanks tina no i didn't touch on that uh, too much because it will become a very long topic but when you when we when Kurt de Waal and ashling and afif when they did the studies they tried to keep the study clean even our own study in edmonton we kept it clean we excluded iugrs we excluded 22 transfusion we excluded diabetic so we try to keep it as clean as possible. Obviously, if the infant is born, let's say severe IUGR, there's already increased afterload in utero and there is already cardiac remodeling occurring in utero. So when they are born ex utero, that is only going to get worse. So definitely IUGR is a very classical uh, scenario in this. And um, trisomy 21 is another evolving uh, new uh, category here. And there is a bunch of categories uh, where we see this. I and mean, that's another different talk on what are the sub subtypes of preterm cardiomyopathy. Um, there was also another um, question about vascular function and what the role of, um, of vascular function in, is in cardiomyopathy. Well, to understand that question, as I showed in that uh, pictograph, I think it's here, the vascular function becomes more manifest in childhood rather than infancy. If you see here, in infancy, it's not as much as in a big issue, at least in the neonatal population. As the child grows, the afterload gets worse. Basically, the LV is pumping against increased uh, SVR and slowly this aortic stiffness index gets worse and the carotid uh, arteries diameter gets uh, thicker. So this vasculopathy starts setting in. And that is probably the beginning of the adult metabolic uh, disease, the adult hypertension, the adult uh, metabolic ischemic heart disease, and the LVH that ensues when they are adult. I, I think this is the, it's a chronology, as you can see in this graph, it starts with the dysfunction, it ends with the structural uh, insufficiency, and it probably ends further into failure at the very end. So it's a continuum. Thank you. Um, one more, um, based on the questions that we received, um, could you sort of summarize what you think are the best measurements that um, people should be doing for diastolic dysfunction in the preterm infant when they're acutely um, in the NICU. And then um, based on all the things that you discussed, um, besides feeding them breast milk, um, are there other um, recommendations that you have in terms of treatment? Yeah, thanks, Tina. Very tough question. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I okay. Let's start with that. Um, besides breast milk, okay. So we cannot um, argue against uh, breast milk. The sooner, the better. Breast milk, um, irrespective of the uh, baby's condition. I think we all can agree uh, on that. And the number two you asked is, what can we do about diastolic dysfunction? What metrics? Well, there's very little data to answer your question from a literature standpoint, but if I use, again, uh, Ashling's and Afif's data, at 12 hours of age, they went in and they did diastolic dysfunction. They found the E prime, E by E prime, sorry, E by A prime was what they used. And our own data from Edmonton, we used E by E prime. I think, um, the adults have it easy. Code de Waal used the modified AAC definition. He used basically these four parameters. But the adults, they use a different number, E by E prime more than 14. Code de Waal used E by E prime more than 18. And then he used LA volume index more than 1.5 mils per kilo. So basically, I think if you were to choose one article uh, to start your practice on assessing LV diastolic, you would probably do Code de Waal's paper, which I showed. Um, that's number one. Number two, um, 
of all the parameters, I think E by E prime is uh, definitely the parameter people are more and more looking at, especially for an early diastolic marker. And we don't do a lot of propagation velocity. We should probably do because that's a marker of things are too late. Now, E by VP is a very sensitive marker for late diastolic problems, and it's been matched with a uh, CAT data. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I think the answer to this question, Tina, is to be very honest, is we don't know, and we're just struggling, and uh, and uh, just um, looking at one or two papers, observational, uh, low quality evidence papers, and trying to make sense of it. The real answer to your question, Tina, is we need to study this. We need to study this, and we need to come up with our own neonatal ACE guidelines and publish it. And actually, we need to actually do a pilot feasibility trial and identify the target population, identify the target window. And I think we need to collaborate with experienced centers like the Japanese. And they have excellent, like Australia, like, you know, Arvind Segal, and they have excellent understanding of stress velocity. We collaborate with them. We do a multinational small pilot feasibility trial and then start looking at the answer. I think that's the real answer. Other than that, this observational studies cannot answer your question uh, accurately, at least. Um, thank you so much. I wanted to see if um, the other panelists have, um, you know, are willing to share their approach. What are, you know, what are you guys doing right now to assess diastolic function in your practices? I can jump in. I, I'm obviously currently in Canada and sorry, and I've only been working here for a little while, so I can't really talk about the practices here. But what I can talk about is back in Australia in Sydney, and and obviously we work closely with Kurt DeWall and and have been working with him. So I guess we we have been following some work by uh, Professor David Osborne back in the early 2000s that was showing poor contractility early on and about it's interesting to hear you saying that you think the the critical time period is between that 12 and 24 hours whereas um you know David showed that poor contractility at three hours so that three to six hours scan was really critical to pr predicting low SVC flow uh, as a marker of systemic blood flow at 24 hours and those babies went on to have IVHs so uh, we we have been and the practice have routinely been scanning these babies uh, it's all babies kind of less than 26 weeks at six hours to look for I guess poor contractility as a marker of uh, I, I guess uh, you know that preterm cardiomyopathy that that ability that poor um uh, heart uh, to cope with those changes and, and the ch rapid changes in the afterload um, and have been treating those with dobutamine that have had low um, or poor contractility to try and compensate that. I think what's really interesting with Adam's study that looked at that used those two co cohorts of formula versus uh, express breast milk is just how that we can have an influence on a long-term influence on the on the cardiac my, the myocardium by simple interventions early in life uh, and i think that's the key is that potentially what we could be doing in the first few days of life can have profound long-term implications um, and whether it is arbs or, or whether there is other interventions to be putting in i think that's the key to take home here is that we do need to get better at recognizing this and understand that these extremely preterms and i, and I guess another little side plug is that uh we've got to remember that a lot of these trials have excluded the 22 23 weekers so those babies and, and uh, it was great to see that in that new breath trial you really um uh, stratified for less than 25 weekers, but we really need to understand that those 22, 23 weekers probably have even a, a more unique uh, physiology uh, and changes. So I think it's key that we start recognizing this and look for it and, and echo what um, Abbas was saying that we just need to get better at looking and researching into this and be more aware of it. I had a question. Um... You know, obviously a symptomatic baby, um, you know, kind of around our chronic lung def uh, disease definition of about 36 weeks, you know, those babies will get echoes in our institution um, looking for chronic pH. Um, 
do in all your institutions recommend or um, uh, just routinely screening all premature babies at a certain gestational age for signs of uh, diastolic dysfunction? And if so, are there uh, interventions that you guys do in an asymptomatic baby knowing that they're at higher risk uh, before going home? Monica, is this for me? Anybody <laughs> but sure you could start. <laughs> yeah, in our institution, uh, we just screen at 36 weeks. Uh, we actually are screening focused on pulmonary hypertension more on the right side of the heart, right? Uh, I don't think we are focusing on the diastolic dysfunction at 36 weeks. So that's a short answer to your question. We would not be looking for diastolic dysfunction at 36 weeks at this stage. Um, I'd say that we try to screen, but we have also had more of the focus on the right heart. Um, at Columbia, but I will say that during training in Iowa, there was an emphasis on doing at that 36 week um, pulmonary hypertension CPH um, screen for those babies. Um, we were starting to pay more attention for diastolic markers and there, um, I know that group published um, uh, specifically babies who had signs of diastolic dysfunction in the context of systemic hypertension. Um, there was, uh, they were starting to implement the use of some ACE inhibitors in some of those babies. Um, to help control um, their blood prep, their hypertension, but it would be in the context of having diastolic markers. I don't think that that's totally evidence-based, but it's more based on the physiology and thinking about what might help in terms of modeling for those babies. So Angelica, just to come in here, you said, interestingly, when you have pulmonary hypertension and you had systemic hypertension in a BPD population, that's when Iowa, they start using some ACE inhibitors. It's interesting because remember the data that I showed from Steve Abman from Colorado, they use the same thing. In babies who are uh, you know, having systemic hypertension and diastolic uh, dysfunction, ACE inhibitors probably has a role in that population. Abbas, can I ask you a question similar along those lines? And I guess it's a provocative question, but do you think the next trial will, will roll for this? So we all know those babies that are have had prolonged mechanical ventilation, have had exposure to a large uh, left to right ductal shunt, have, you know, you scan them and you see quite a dilated left atrium with a large LAAO ratio. Do you think there's a role for ARBs there? Or should we trial that? You already started your question by saying it's a provocative question. Mm -hmm. I actually have a slide as what I think we can study. And I'm really interested to push this um, um, space forward uh, with collaboration from all of you. Okay, sorry, my apologies. All right, so I don't know what you guys think and we can discuss this offline, online, but I think a few things we can definitely start doing. One is, um, we definitely need to talk to our families about this ELBW um, data that uh, we have to include it in our counseling. That's number one. That's uh, easy because the data is there. We just have to tell them. In terms of studying this space, I think we can start with like a feasibility trial, something like the Smart PD has done. And I, I go on um, again to repeat that we need to collaborate with uh, pediatric cardiology, maybe, uh, maybe go to Japan and do a site visit or uh, go to Melbourne and see what uh, Arvind is doing. And all the experts in this area collaborate and then we come up with a feasibility, multinational uh, feasibility trial. And then we pick our patient population and uh, you can pick 26, 27 weeks. And in terms of intervention, what I think we, we could do is definitely the breast milk. We probably have to do a Q eight to 12 hours of TNE to catch the window. And you said, um, Nick, that David Osborne's study about 12, six hours, they already starting to see the differences. Um, in, the, in the study from Japan, they also started to see the differences early on, but I thought uh, 12 hours was like a clear window when start, things uh, start becoming different. So anywhere between the six to 12 hours window, if we start doing echoes, and if the infant has any sign of LV diastolic dysfunction, large PDA, respiratory insufficiency, and we all can come up together with a with a collaborative protocol, we can start them on low dose nitrates. So that end there, which is a uh, asterisk 
is low dose nitrates. And I looked into literature. Have we done low dose nitrates in preterms? Yes, we have. Um, there's, I think, good studies, um, good uh, case reports when we have a UAC um, or any uh, radial outline. Uh, they have, the fingers are uh, ischemic. We use nitro patches. And the dose of that drug is actually more than what the Japanese are using. So it's not that the extreme preterm cannot tolerate. It's probably we just have to start at a very, very low dose. The Japanese are using 0.1 to 0.3. We can probably use at 0.05. All you need is that a little bit of touch of relaxation and probably the pulmonary capillary wet pressures can be a little bit lesser. And definitely the PDA, you have to go after it. Otherwise, it's just going to add to the left retrocardiac dysfunction as Court Duval uh, showed us. So this is um, an idea and I'm happy to hear from all the panelists and speakers um, and uh, audience if we can collaborate and move this uh, space further. Sure, sign me up. <laughs> Thanks, Nick. <laughs> oh, one more thing. In terms of follow-up, I think um, our networks are all collecting neurodevelopmental outcomes, but nobody is collecting cardiovascular outcomes. I think at some point people should start collecting that. And um, I talked about the preterm correction factor has to be incorporated in the next round of calculations. Jokes aside, I think like I think this is a great idea, Abbas. I think where you're going to struggle will be potentially with your you know intervention number two there, the catching the window and and having enough people around to who who can. Uh, competently get these get the measurements required from TNE. But if you yeah. can overcome that hurdle, I think that this is definitely something worth doing. Even if you you know, even if that is the intervention itself, it's just to have a look and, and get some more data on these longitudinal data on these extremely preterms and, and including those really small, those tiny babies. Agreed, Nick. I wonder Abbas whether right the the platform of NHRC might be might be right you can tap into that and see if right like you can get a group of people who are interested and circulate. I'm not sure how it uh, like how they can coordinate, but I'm I'm sure there are right uh, many sites and um, investigators who are part of this platform. So to to kind of get interest and you know build up a group where you can kind of investigate this further. Uh, there's one more question about uh, 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 one of the audience members saying that it's a great talk. What's the impact of diastolic dysfunction on IVRT in preterm babies? So IVRT, it's interesting that it goes both ways. So if you have a mild diastolic dysfunction, your IVRT is prolonged because it takes a long relaxation. And if your diastolic dysfunction is worse, then it becomes lesser, the IVRT becomes lesser, becomes what it becomes a pseudo normalization. And if it becomes extreme diastolic dysfunction, then it becomes very short. So IVRT, all types of IVRT can be seen in the spectrum of diastolic dysfunction from mild to severe. So that's why IVRT alone cannot be uh, given so much emphasis. So that's why the uh, diastology experts, they're telling not only IVRT, you have to look at D-cell time, mitral valve D-cell time, you have to look at the mitral valve A duration. You have to look at the mitral, uh, the pulmonary valve, pulmonary vein AR duration. So you have to put these four parameters together to understand whether that child or that infant is having diastolic dysfunction, yes or no. So IVRT alone um, will not answer that question because all types of IVRT can be seen in all types of diastolic dysfunction, unfortunately. And then uh, one, uh, I think there are no more questions. Uh, just uh, one uh, last question. So we know that there are epidemiologic studies showing the adult onset of cardiovascular disease among this preterm population. And now, as you showed ni nicely, Abbas, there are a lot of st studies showing that there are all these cardiac changes that you could diagnose using MRI or echocardiography. Uh, the question is, how important is to link these two, right? Like, I, I don't know whether we have data showing that uh, young adults who have these changes in the heart, whether they go on to finally, like I think we have data from other populations saying that all these changes are high risk for kind of ischemic heart disease or heart failure in the future. 
But do we have any of that data among the preterm population showing that with this cardiac changes, they are going to have those kind of outcomes? Or is that the, the link between the two? How crucial or how important is that to show that all these changes in the echo markers eventually would lead to all the outcomes that we are talking about? Yeah, I think I showed that, well, I think um, the Huck step uh, sh study, and I showed that um, with increasing uh, our prematurity, so the more premature you are, there are more risk of cardiac failure. For example, I think that slide which I showed with a 17 times increased risk of cardiac failure if you're born less than 28 weeks. And I would say if you're born less than 26 weeks, is probably more than that, definitely, uh, the squaring and the doubling effect. So to answer your question, Deepak, definitely there is high risk of cardiac failure. When there is high risk of cardiac failure, there's high risk of uh, death, cardiovascular death and cerebrovascular death. Yeah, uh, my, my question was uh, like, is there, do we need to link the changes that we, that we are finding in the 20, 30 year old population to those outcomes is that is that has that been shown or is it not really needed at this point from all the other studies in normal adults right, right. like if you have at 20 years if you have these echo changes does it mean that okay that uh, person's risk at 50 or 60 years for cardiovascular outcomes are going to be much worse is that I is that know. already known or i don't know if i uh, there is known the only best data we have uh, Deepak, is adam lundowski's cardiac mri data and in that data, he used uh, patients in the 30s. So I think to answer your question, we know answer till about the 30s. If your question is what happens to them when they are 50s or 60s, if that's your question, the answer is no, because this is an evolving subject. Maybe in the next generation, when these uh, adults become 50s and 60s, then we'll know what happened to their heart. But we only have data till about the 30s. Uh, because that's the best data is Adam Lewandowski's data, which is, I think the oldest patient in his data set was 35, 36 old. So definitely yeah. less than 40, yeah. Any other last minute comments from any of the panelists before we conclude? No, I just say fantastic overview of the, you know, the preterm cardiomyopathy and, and the role of diastolic dysfunction. I, I you know, I think we, we're probably only just starting to get an understanding of this and it's probably even more complicated than what we think. You know, Kurt DeWall is starting to look at, you know, blood speckle tracking and showing in, in these preterm babies that the way that blood then travels through the heart uh, following these remodeling is completely different. So that's something as well that we need to take into consideration. So thanks, Abbas, for your review and overview of this. I have uh, one uh answer to my question nobody discussed this i'll um i'll go back to that okay so this person nobody answered this question yet so he is actually uh kawasaki professor kawasaki of kawasaki disease i think why he is relevant here because he diagnosed uh kawasaki in 1961 but nelson textbook did not put kawasaki disease on its textbook until 1992 so there were 31 years went by where Children died of Kawasaki heart disease, and the Western literature did not recognize this as a condition. It is provocative, but it also tells us that just because uh, we are not having easy access to a literature from one part of the world doesn't mean that disease doesn't exist, or uh, are we wasting time but not investigating this? Because the reason I'm bringing this is the Japanese have, have already approached this for the last 15 years but it is not a mainstream approach in the rest of the world. So I think it's relevant here. Maybe we are waiting too long to start uh, studying this uh, aspect and maybe there is some way we can help these uh, children moving forward. Okay, thanks. Fantastic work, uh, Abbas. And thank you to all the panelists and the audience for joining today. Thank you. Thank you so much for this great talk. Thanks, guys.